Members, please take your seats. <laughs> Members will have been saddened to learn of the passing of the former Deputy First Minister, Mr. Martin McGuinness. I have therefore considered it appropriate to invite members to gather here today so that they might have an opportunity to pay tributes and offer condolences. This opportunity is not a sitting of the Assembly. After I have paid my own respects, I will invite members to pay their respects. The Chamber is often the scene of the cut and thrust of political debate when the focus is solely on our differences. However, my predecessor Mitchell McLaughlin put it well when marking the passing of Lord Barnside when he said that no matter about the heat of the political disagreements that we have in this House or elsewhere, ultimately we are all made of the same flesh and bone. It is unfortunate that it is often only in illness or in death that we take a step back to reflect a broader perspective on the contribution made by colleagues. As a member, as a minister, and as Deputy First Minister, Martin McGuinness was an integral part of this institution since its inception in 1998. Many members have sat in this chamber in that period, but few have demonstrated the same level of commitment to this Assembly. Indeed, without Martin McGuinness, it is questionable whether there would be an Assembly. It is important, therefore, to find a way to ensure that members could gather to pay their respects and express condolences to the wider McGuinness family. For while we recognise that there is a desire to look back on a political career, on an occasion such as this, we are mindful that a family is grieving for a husband, father, brother and grandfather, and as party colleagues are mourning the loss of their leader and friend. In an assembly which is about facilitating different points of view, we respect the fact that many will only be able to focus on specific points of Martin McGuinness' life in a way that is shaped by their own experiences. However, to have a full understanding of our history and politics, we realise that if we reflect solely on one single moment or event in time, we are unlikely to learn <coughs> the full story. In tributes to him yesterday, the phrase that was often used was that Martin McGuinness had been on a journey. It is clear, though, that he was not a passenger, but was determined to lead the way for others to come with him. When reflecting on a journey, we will remember where we started, but it is also important to recognise how far we have travelled and the destination we have reached. That is equally true of the life of Martin McGuinness. A few years ago, as Deputy First Minister, Martin McGuinness participated in the unveiling of the portraits of Seamus Heaney and C.S. Lewis, which hang in this building. The Heaney portrait includes the line from the Cure at Troy, Believe that a further shore is reachable from here. In his role in this assembly, Martin McGuinness was motivated by reaching that further shore for the good of this society. We want to thank him for his significant and long-standing public service in this assembly and to our politics more widely. We thank his wife, Bernie, his children, his wider family circle for supporting him in that service. And on behalf of this assembly, I express our deepest sympathies and condolences to the family circle. Members, I will now invite the party leaders to speak for about five minutes to pay tribute to our colleague. I will then call members as they rise in their places. I will not be imposing strict time constraints, but I encourage members to be brief, probably no more than three minutes.
to give time for as many as possible in the time I have allocated for the tributes. When tributes are concluded, members are welcome to join me in the Great Hall for the signing of the Book of Condolences. The Book of Condolences will be available for members and staff to sign up until 2.30 this afternoon, after which it will be open to the public. The House will now pay its own respects, and I call Ms. Michelle O'Neill. I am only too proud to stand here today to speak and to say a few words about our friend Martin McGuinness and my comments are on behalf of all of our Sinn Féin team here in the Assembly Chamber today and indeed on behalf of all of our party right across the island of Ireland. Martin McGuinness was a political visionary. He played a key and enormous part in delivering fundamental change in this society and in transforming the relationships on this island and between these islands. He was a gifted political strategist, an orator, a thinker and an occasional angler when he got the chance. And in earlier life he was a talented footballer, or at least that's what he told us. But for the Sinn Féin MLAs in this chamber and for the Irish Republican family across this island and beyond, he was our leader, he was our inspiration, our role model and he was, above all else, our dear and valued friend. And so it's with a broken heart, but a heart that's bursting with pride, that I have the honour and privilege to pay tribute to him today. I want to send all of our love to Bernie, Grania, Fanula, Fakra and Emmett and the wider McGuinness clan. He was our leader, but he was their daddy, your husband, your granddad and your brother. We are very conscious of your pain, and we will never forget the sacrifices you made through many long and difficult years of struggle, during which Martin, as always, led from the front. I hope that they can take some comfort from the knowledge that Martin gave so much of his life, of his time and his energy to make the lives of others better and to build in a better future for all of our people. Martin grew up in the poverty of the Bogside. He witnessed discrimination, inequality and oppression. He didn't look away or run away from the challenges. With others in his generation, he decided to confront these injustices. The struggle for equality, respect and self-determination for the people of this island became his life's work. His leadership and the example he set will continue to inspire those of us who are determined to build a better future for all the generations to come. As in so many things, Martin set the standard. He challenged us constantly, all to do more, by always doing more himself, by always going further and challenging himself and all of us to reach out to our political opponents. He believed that society should be judged by how it treats the most vulnerable citizens and he stood up for those who needed his help and support time and time again. He forced people out of comfort zones. He took bold initiatives to drive the peace and political processes forward. In his last public appeal, he urged people to choose hope over fear, to put equality and respect for all of our people at the heart of the power institutions. And that should be the clarion call for all in this chamber in the weeks, months and years ahead. The legacy that Martin wished was for a better future based on equality and measured by the joy and laughter of all of our children. So on behalf of Sinn Féin, I rededicate our party to completing his life's work and to living through his legacy. Gormila Maugov. Call Mrs. Arlene Foster. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. And uh, I'll be making these remarks on behalf of the Democratic Unionist Party. And it is fitting, as elected representatives, that we gather here in the Assembly Chamber to acknowledge the passing of Martin McGuinness. And as I said yesterday, uh, Martin was first and foremost a much loved husband father and grandfather. He was immensely proud of his children and grandchildren and often said that although he had travelled the world and met presidents, prime ministers and even royalty, that his heart was very much with his family and in his home city. So today it is important to remember that at the heart of this, in the midst of the headlines, the opinions and the commentary, that there is a family that is very much suffering the pain and the grief of loss. 
So my thoughts and prayers, just as they have been since his death was announced, are with Martin's wife and family circle. And just like Northern Ireland's history and our troubled past, Martin McGuinness's legacy is complex and it is challenging. And I know this is a hugely difficult time for many across Northern Ireland, difficult for many different reasons. There are many victims who are feeling very hurt because painful memories and scars left by their own loss will have been opened up again. And I would never seek to minimise the very real pain that they are going through. Indeed, I understand that pain and I empathise with all those innocent victims throughout Northern Ireland. But I do recognise also that there are many Republicans and Nationalists who look to Martin as a leader, friend or mentor who will be feeling a very real sense of loss that he has died in this way at the relatively young age of 66. History will judge and as in all things history will have the final say. There's been much talk of my personal working relationship with Martin. He never sought to airbrush the past and neither did I. And of course it's precisely because of his past, because of his involvement with the IRA in the 70s and 80s, because of his influence within those circles that he was able to play the role he played in bringing the Republican movement towards using peaceful and democratic means. And because of all of that, I doubt we will ever see his like again. Our differing backgrounds and our different life experiences inevitably meant that there was much to separate us and it would of course be wrong not to acknowledge that. But we both shared a deep desire to see the devolved institutions up and running and we worked hard to achieve positive results for everyone. We both served continuously as government ministers since 2007 and during all of that time I think he wanted to do good and to work for all of the people of Northern Ireland. That was certainly the sense I got from him and I hope it was the sense he got from me as well. During those 10 years we have been through some very good times and some very dark times. We travelled the world to promote Northern Ireland on the international stage. We brought back jobs, boosted our tourism industry. From the Irish Open to Game of Thrones, we had some fabulous wins. But I also think of the various murders which occurred during those 10 years. In 2009, sappers Mark Quincy and Patrick Azamkar were gunned down in Antrim, followed soon by uh, the murder of police officer Stephen Carroll. And then in 2011, Ronan Kerr was brutally murdered in Oma. Those murders were a direct challenge to the executive and Peter Robinson as First Minister and Martin McGuinness as Deputy First Minister faced those challenges. Then of course in more recent times we had the murder of Kevin McGuigan and the huge challenge which that brought to the executive back in 2015. There were other tragedies as well and this time last year I joined, I joined with Martin in his home city as we visited the McGrady family after that horrific incident at Buncrana Pier. Why do I recall all of this? Well, in the recent past much has been made of the collapse of these institutions but it is important to remember what has been achieved through all of the difficulties. Some people make the throwaway comment that nothing has changed in Northern Ireland, but that is so wrong. Things have fundamentally changed since I was growing up in the 70s and 80s and changed immeasurably for the better. And Martin McGuinness did play a role which I will always condemn in the 70s and 80s, but I also have to acknowledge the role which he played over this last decade uh, and more in government in Northern Ireland. To finish, one of the events uh, I attended with Martin last year was the opening of the Heaney Centre in Balaki, a beautiful tribute to his favourite poet. So I'll finish with a quote, part of which has already been uh, referred to by the speaker, a quote from Heaney. So hope for a great sea change on the far side of revenge. Believe that further shore is reachable from here. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Call Mr. Colum Eastwood. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you for offering us this opportunity um, to pay uh, our respects uh, to Martin McGuinness. Can I first of all uh, offer our support and prayers to, to Bernie and the whole McGuinness uh, family? I think the people 
uh, of Ireland uh, are, are thinking of them uh, at this very, very difficult time. And we always have to remember in the full media glare uh, of these things that there's a family uh, at the centre of it and uh, grieving. I'm very uh, happy as uh, a fellow leader, uh, a constituency colleague, and I think most importantly as a fellow uh, dairyman uh, to stand here and uh, offer uh, a few words on behalf of the SDLP. Uh, Martin was somebody who was very proud of his roots, very proud of his city, uh, and I am also uh, very proud of that city. He is somebody who understood that Derry was the crucible of the peace process and created many uh, leaders uh, from John Hume to Mark Durgan to himself and many other standout people uh, who helped to move this society uh, from a very dark place uh, to the uh, much better place that we are in uh, today. And I think we all have to be thankful for the journey that Martin McGuinness uh, embarked upon. We could talk all day about that journey and much has been made about that journey. It was a journey that started in violence uh, but ended up uh, very much grounded in the principles of peace uh, and partnership. And I was always taught to take people as you find them. And I found uh, for me in my experience with Martin McGuinness that peace wasn't a tactic. It had become a fundamental principle of everything uh, that he did. And I think that has to be uh, remembered uh, when we remember Martin McGuinness uh, in uh, the round. He was also somebody who didn't just take his own journey. He brought other people with him. And that has been uh, in large part the foundation of the, pro of the progress that we've been able uh, to make. And of course we have to remember victims on days like this. But the best way to remember victims, uh, Mr. Speaker, is for all of us to commit to solving the problems. For, ask, for all, all of us to commit to doing the things that victims want us to do. We have that opportunity in the next few days. We have a duty in the next few days to once and for all uh, meet the needs uh, of those victims. Because I think one of the things that will mark uh, the last number of decades, and in particular his time as Deputy First Minister, uh, that will mark Martin McGuinness's time uh, in that office, will be his generosity of spirit, his ability to reach beyond his own constituency, his ability to reach beyond and speak to his own base. And I think all of us uh, should think about that in the coming days. We should think about that generosity of spirit. We should embrace the opportunity to build a different type of future, where unionism doesn't try to dominate nationalism, where nationalism doesn't try, doesn't try to dominate unionism, where together we can build a society uh, that all of us can be proud of. And I think that uh, is the job that we have now. Uh, beyond uh, this meeting today, we have the opportunity to do what I think Martin McGuinness would have wanted us to do, uh, to go down uh, to Stormont Castle and to finish uh, the job. Because as, the, the, as, as Seamus Heaney did say, a further shore is reachable uh, from here, but it's up to us uh, to make it happen. Thank you. I call Mr. Mike Nesbitt. Thank you. Um, I'm afraid this isn't going to work for me unless I am honest. And, and I think the difficulty with trying to be honest on an occasion like this is the danger uh, of, of causing offence. And offence is the last thing that I want to cause today. Uh, I want to acknowledge these are difficult and painful times for many, many people. Uh, for the McGuinness family, uh, for the people of the bog side, for Sinn Féin, uh, and for Irish republicanism. And I want to acknowledge the pain uh, of the members of opposite. Uh, who mourn uh, the grievous loss uh, of an icon. Uh, but it would also be dishonest to ignore uh, the pain and the difficulty of the many victims of the IRA uh, at this time. I was actually listening on the radio to Kathleen Gillespie earlier, uh, widow of Patsy, the man who was strapped to the seat of the, uh, the car of his van, uh, turned into a human bomb and he died in an explosion along with, with five soldiers. I think Kathleen is just one of many victims who regrets that Martin McGuinness chose to take to the grave information uh, that might have helped uh, people who simply want to know the truth about what happened to their loved ones. And I also regret that he chose not to share what he knew. Uh, Martin McGuinness knew my view uh, that nobody needed to die to get to where we are today. And I know he disagreed uh, very actively and at times 
violently. He also knew I did not agree uh, that circumstances left him no choice but to join the IRA. Uh, if you pick up a gun, you detonate a bomb or you order an attack, you are making a choice. And history will reflect the enduring harm done during the Troubles. But history will also reflect on Martin McGuinness as more than an IRA commander. He was one of the most significant figures in this place uh, over the last 10 years. And I would be confident history will be positive, very positive, about his motivation as a politician during the last decade. And it would be dishonest, and frankly it would be cowardly of me, if I didn't reflect on my personal dealings with Martin McGuinness. I think we met three times one to one, and I do mean just the two of us. And he was clearly a man of his word, he was a straight dealing individual, and he was a man of political integrity. Now, the best conversation we ever had was when one day, quite by chance, we went for a walk around the grounds of this great estate. And if anybody needed convinced Martin McGuinness was genuine about wanting devolution to work, that was the conversation to tune into. If unionism has anything to learn from Martin McGuinness, it's the importance of outreach. He reached far beyond his comfort zone on so many occasions and occasionally he complained for some reason that unionism did not always reciprocate. Last year I debated with Martin McGuinness in Bundoran at an event organized by Drew University from New Jersey. Uh, the audience was Irish Republican and Irish American uh, so as I said at the time it was an away match for me uh, but sometimes away goals count double. Well, Martin McGuinness was not afraid of a political away match, and unionism must learn, and we must do better in terms of taking our case to the widest possible audience and doing so with confidence and with pride. I've been listening to the, the public debate since Martin's death, uh, and naturally, opinion is split. Nobody should forget or try to airbrush out those early years. He certainly never did. Nor should we disrespect those who cannot forgive. But we in this chamber are elected to be leaders, and we need to show some empathy. Republicans, nationalists, unionists, loyalists, we're not going away, and we're going to have to find a way to at least uh, rub along together, but perhaps go a bit further and deliver on the commitments of the Belfast Agreement in terms of reconciliation, tolerance, trust building, and showing each other some mutual respect and the starting place is here in this chamber. Let us remember that the purpose of political debate is not victory but communal progress. Martin McGuinness's commitment to these devolved institutions is being hailed as unique within Sinn Féin for the sake of the future of devolution let us hope that is not the case. Call Mrs. Naomi Law. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I want to begin, first of all, by paying my condolences um, to Bernie, um, to the children and to the grandchildren, and also to the wider McGuinness family circle. In our, they're in our thoughts and prayers very much at this time, um, not just in these very difficult days, but also in the difficult weeks and months and years that lie ahead. One of my memories of Martin outside of this place was when I met him um, in his own home city. Um, I was there with my family having dinner and we happened to be in the same restaurant. And I introduced him to my young nephew and I said, this is a very important man. And he looked around and said, does somebody come in? Um, and my nephew was quite amused but um, got to meet him and talk with him. And it was clear that he was at his happiest and most relaxed when he was at home with his family, and it will be their loss that will be greatest of all. I also want to offer my condolences um, to Michelle and her colleagues, both in this chamber and further afield, for their loss, um, because I know that they will very much miss him as a guide and as a mentor and as a friend. I also want to acknowledge that there are those who suffered, um, both as a result of the IRA campaign and also more widely um, in the Troubles who today will find this a very difficult time.
I don't want to minimise their feelings or their experience, nor do I want to appear to absolve um, the wrong that was done during that period, simply to acknowledge um, the difficulty that they will have at this time, and to hope that in our efforts to find a better way forward, we can bring some comfort to them too. Martin's life as a public figure is well documented, both his early life and his involvement in the IRA campaign, and also his pivotal role in bringing that violent campaign to an end and moving us to the place we are today. I do not believe that we would enjoy the relative peace we do today if it were not for people like Martin McGuinness and others who showed the vision and the leadership and the courage to move from very entrenched positions in the darkest of times to offer hope of a better future. For that, I am grateful. Despite all of our political differences, I want to pay tribute to his service in this Assembly as an MLA, as a Minister and also as Deputy First Minister over 10 years. In that role, he continued to show leadership and not only to challenge his opponents in the Chamber, but often to stretch his own constituency in order that we could continue to move forward together. If we are to do so, Mr Speaker, we need to find ways to be reconciled, not just to each other, but to our painful and troubled past. We need to pay our debt of gratitude to those, all of those who have brought us this far. I believe we best repay that debt by fulfilling our primary duty and responsibility as elected representatives to deliver a better legacy to the next generation than the one which we inherited and to offer them a more complete process of peacemaking and reconciliation than the rather fragile and incomplete one that we have at the moment. Thank you. Call Mr Stephen Agnew. On behalf of the Green Party in Northern Ireland, I wish to express our condolences to the family, friends and colleagues of Martin McGuinness. My experience of Martin was really through this chamber and, and, and through these corridors. My first time meeting him was when I was a, a researcher and we were in a stationery cupboard and I found it very bizarre as a boy from Ballybean to be speaking to Martin McGuinness about the weather and about normal everyday conversation. And that's how the relationship continued. He always had the time for a chat. Uh, he always took the time and he was always friendly um, in his engagements. In a professional role I always found him respectful and I always found him as someone I could work with. And again, he, he always treated me with respect as a political colleague and never in any way acted superior. And that was the Martin McGuinness I knew. And there'll be many here who knew him better. It's unfortunate, but I suppose inevitable, that we try to reflect on everything good and bad about a politician's political career when they die. I believe the time to do that is when their political career ends. Yesterday a man died and I believe every death should be mourned. Call Mr. Jim Allister. Every death brings grief and sorrow to the family and friends of the deceased and rightly evokes sympathy for the family. And it is no different in the case of Mr. McGuinness. But what is different is that he himself bears responsibility for many violent and needless deaths in our community. As an IRA terrorist and commander, his hands drip with the blood of the innocent. He goes to his grave having shown no remorse, no regret, no apology. 
for the terror he brought to our streets. Rather, continuing to justify that bloodthirsty wickedness that was the IRA campaign. Martin McGuinness died on the 21st of March at the age of 66. On the 21st of March, 1988, a young police officer from my constituency, Constable Clive Graham, died on that same date, the 21st of March. Murdered in the Cregan estate by the IRA. Shot at a checkpoint. He never got the chance to live to 66. He never got the chance to marry his girlfriend of the time. He never got the chance to see children and grandchildren. Why? Because a man of blood decided he would die. And that, sadly, can be recited and recounted many, many times. Because Mr. McGuinness thought it appropriate not just to sanction and to commit murder, but to take those dark secrets with him, denying truth and justice to many of his IRA victims. His Republican code of silence trumped his every posturing as a peacemaker, meaning that for many, myself included, his abiding legacy is that of a victim maker. As evidenced so chillingly by our graveyards. So today, my thoughts primarily are with the many victims of Martin McGuinness's murderous IRA. And thus, I come to note the death of Martin McGuinness, but not to praise him. I call Mr. Jerry Carroll. I want to offer my sincere and heartfelt condolences to the family of Martin McGuinness today, a uh, family who have lost a husband, um, a father, a brother and a grandfather. I also want to offer my condolences uh, on behalf of People Before Profit to the members and supporters of Sinn Féin who are dealing with the loss uh, of uh, one of their leaders. And there will be a time, Mr Speaker, uh, they offer a more rounded and detailed assessment of the legacy of Martin McGuinness. For me, today will not be that day. One reason I say this, Mr Speaker, is because of the hurt already caused by attempts in the media since Martin McGuinness's passing to rewrite history and to create a simplistic narrative of the bad man who went good, the ex-combatant who saw the error of his ways and became a peacemaker. This kind of narrative may make, uh, make for a good Hollywood film, Mr. Speaker, but reality is much more complex than that. Martin McGuinness was, of course, a product of his environment. No doubt he was a product of the bog site and the community he grew up in. But he's also a product of a discriminatory state, of the decades-long denial of civil rights, the Catholics, and the disastrous reaction of the then establishment in this House and the establishment in London to the peaceful demands for change in this country. No one, therefore, can seriously criticise Martin McGuinness and the choices he made without an understanding of the way the powerful forces created the environment in which, this, which he and thousands of other people grew up in. Martin would eventually become a major player in politics here who came to have a role in shaping this country. 
and he took many decisions that I may not agree with, even strongly disagree with, both in his early days before I was born and the, the later journey that led him to this House. And it may not be custom in this House to quote Karl Marx, Mr Speaker, but Marx once wrote something that I think is pertinent today in the discussion about Martin McGuinness. He said, men make history, but not in circumstances of their own choosing. Martin McGuinness did not choose the circumstances in which he made history. And whatever disagreements I would have with him, I appreciate his efforts to ensure that those who set out to make history in the future may do so in circumstances very different from those he and others were forced to endure. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I call Ms Claire Sogdon. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I want to offer my sincere condolences to Martin's family and friends. Um, I also want to offer my condolences to Michelle and Sinn Féin and their followers. Um, I do believe that it is entirely appropriate that we as colleagues pay our respects to the passing of Martin McGuinness and also show grace and compassion to those people today who are hurting and mourning his loss. I uh, vaguely remember the troubles, Mr. Speaker, and it was so much the worst of times. And perhaps today is not the best of times, but we are at peace, and that is the most important thing. And I think from then until now, Martin McGuinness was part of that journey to peace, and I think that's something that we need to acknowledge. Fortunately, I'm not in a position where I need to forgive uh, Mr. Speaker. And there are many out there who are, and we have seen the comments and heard the comments in the past couple of days. I fully understand and I fully respect the comments of people. Um, I think um, following Martin's passing is something that we all would have expected. But what I do believe is that, and I, and I do, I, I was particularly touched by the comments of Ian Paisley Jr. yesterday when he says it's not necessarily how you begin your life, it's how you end your life. And certainly I think Martin McGuinness's contribution to the peace of this country and how we can move forward to a better place is important. I, um, I was a child of the Good Friday Agreement. Um, I am a unionist. I was brought up thinking a very certain way about Martin McGuinness. But when I became a member of the executive last year, my opinion did significantly change. Because he was very kind and generous and supportive of me in that role. And I think that's important. As political leaders, that's, that's the way we need to take forward. I was also touched that when my predecessor passed away uh, two years ago, Martin attended that funeral. And I think, again, he showed a credible amount of leadership. And I think um, the opportunity and the comments that we're hearing around this chamber today demonstrate that leadership that we need to keep thinking about if we are going to move Northern Ireland forward. Um, I think if, if there's a legacy that we, that we need to ensure, it is that these institutions need to work. And I think for the greater good, not for my generation, but indeed the generation after, we need to keep moving forward. And I think that's the positive message that we can take um, out of this sad time today. Thank you. I invite any other member that wishes to speak to rise in their place. Call Ms. Claire Bailey. Thank you, Speaker. I buried my own father last summer, and I know the pain that that brings. So today, I and my party leader, Stephen Agnew, on behalf of the Green Party, send our deepest condolences to the entire McGuinness family circle in this time of grief and we wish them every strength needed to get through the tough times ahead. As a relatively new member to this assembly, my personal dealings with Martin McGuinness were limited, but what I did see was a man who carried himself with a calm authority and seemingly without effort had the full attention of people in a room. Never once did he pass me without a nod and a smile and always acknowledged me by name. I've listened to much of the commentary since his death was announced yesterday about his journey from paramilitary to politician, that his story did not start with the IRA nor with a bomb or a bullet. His story starts from the beginning as a boy from the bog side. His journey in life should be acknowledged as a powerful one, even to those, myself included, who would not and did not choose to walk in his shoes or choose the paths and actions in life that he did. I have had heard various people who have worked closely with Martin McGuinness through the peace negotiations 
say that without him there would be no Northern Ireland Assembly today. Well, let's make a commitment not to make the mistake of having no Assembly after his passing. Let us not take for granted that this institution can be allowed to fall without a full understanding of what that may lead to. If we cannot continue to move forward, if we cannot find it within ourselves to be peacemakers, reconciled with where we are today, how we've got here, and what still needs to be achieved, then we all fail as leaders. When he said recently there will be no return to the status quo, this should echo today as a warning about much more than an RHI scandal and the failure of a single executive. Our fragile peace process is at a crossroads. The choices made from everyone in this chamber today will greatly influence the road we next travel. I've also listened to victims tell their often harrowing stories through media channels. I hope we've all listened because it is impossible not to feel their pain, their trauma and their continued hurt. But what is also blatantly obvious as I have listened is that we as a society urgently need to find it within ourselves to come to terms with our past, to give some form of peace to those still living that pain, that trauma and that hurt. Because that is not the past, that is very much the present and will continue into our future if we cannot commit to giving the space and structure that is desperately needed and required by so many. This is a responsibility that lies firmly with both the British and Irish governments as well as with ourselves. Let us take an opportunity offered today to see how far we have come, to understand the concession, compromise and commitment will be central to where we need to be and to do all within our power to choose the best way forward, bring in people with us, as many of those who have gone before us have shown, these are the real and true signs of leadership. Call Mr. David Ford. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I also express my personal sympathy to Bernie McGuinness and her family and family circle, and to Michelle and our colleagues in Sinn Féin in this place? Much has been said about Martin, and it doesn't all need to be repeated at this stage. But I certainly think we should acknowledge the personality he was when he reached the end of the journey of which others have spoken. I can think in particular of just one social occasion, the game for Anto, Gaelic football match played at Ravenhill, when at the meal beforehand, while others were tending to assemble around tables in their own comfort zones, Martin McGuinness ended up sitting down between the wife of the Chief Constable and the wife of the Justice Minister, because that was his personality, always seeking to reach out. And there's absolutely no doubt in my mind as the one who had the privilege of becoming the first devolved Justice Minister here, that he played a fundamental role in ensuring that this Assembly and its institutions were complete with the devolution of justice in 2010. Without him putting his efforts into that, I don't think we would have seen that change occur. And I can also remember just a few weeks into my time as Minister, when a potentially difficult issue difficult for me as Minister and difficult for Sinn Féin occurred, which was resolved in a quiet conversation in the Castle. Martin gave his word and he stuck to his word. So yes, today we should remember that there is a past and there are those who are suffering today as they hear tributes paid to the man that Martin McGuinness became. And it's not for people like me who didn't suffer personally to criticise them. But let us acknowledge that at the end of the road, Martin McGuinness made significant moves in terms of his outreach, particularly on policing and justice issues, which ensured that we are all in a much better place than we were, and let us resolve to continue that work.
Members, that concludes tributes to Martin McGuinness. I invite the party leaders to join me in the rotunda before proceeding to the Great Hall to sign the Book of Condolences, followed by any other member who wishes to do so. Thank you. 